to express our sincere appreciation to the Philippine Institute for Development Studies for inviting us to share the findings of a regional online survey that my center conducted late last year and disseminated via regional report survey in January this year. Now, the organizers have given us 20 minutes to share some key points uh, from the survey findings. So, I will limit the presentation to the time that we have and just give a brief introduction of what the survey is about and then go straight into the key findings that are relevant for the discussions uh, of your conference today. Copies of the survey report have been provided to the PITS for circulation prior to this conference and more detailed information is provided there. Uh, but just very quickly, allow me to highlight that this is a regional online survey that the Asian Studies Center conducted in late 2018 and primarily it was to seek the views of Southeast Asians on regional affairs, the state of the region. Now, the survey is what we would like to call a regular exercise on our center. And the initial motivation to come up with surveys that somehow try to gauge the pulse of the region among the policy elites, so those who are in a position to inform or influence policy, really started when the Trump administration uh, took over in uh, the United States. And our first uh, foray into gauging Southeast Asian attitudes towards the state of the region started with how Southeast Asians viewed uh, the United States under the Trump administration vis-a-vis -vis its engagement uh, with this region. And one of the questions there uh, pertains to which among the major powers would do the right thing, as it were, in contributing to global peace, security, prosperity, and governance, things that world leaders, leading nations of the world, are expected to take the lead in. And the findings for the survey on the Trump administration shows some interesting results. Both China and the United States ranked uh, quite low in the trust ratings on doing the right thing, and Japan ranked quite high. And so, fast forward to the region today, uh, there are continuing uncertainties, and we felt that a broader survey to look at sentiments of policy agents in this region towards developments regionally and globally uh, was due. And so therefore, the State of the Southeast Asian Survey uh, was uh, an exercise that we started and aimed to continue uh, every year. The sampling is purposeful, but it's, uh, it's not representative. We have highlighted that this is more or less an elite survey. Our target respondents are the policy elites, which uh, I have mentioned earlier on, that are in a position to inform or to influence policy. And so it really is um, a survey about the, the perceptions and attitudes prevalent among those in this type of position uh, regarding the regional issues and concerns in politics, economics, and social issues. I'd like to quickly present key findings in several sections of the survey. The whole survey itself has over 30 questions, but what we would like to do here is to um, highlight some pertinent points related to the economy, to security issues, to the role of the US and China, um, as well as the economic and political influence of uh, major powers, and um, also, the trust and influence soft power issues. Well, starting off with developments or implications for the regional economy, it was interesting that when we asked the respondents about how they used the state of the region's economy in 2019, 
there were quite some positive views about the region's economic resilience. But uh, those kinds of uh, positive views did not carry over into uh, the economic horizon with regard to multilateral trade arrangements, uh, as well as the impact of the trade war between the United States and China. So what you will see on this slide is um, the, the numbers that show that uh, there's not that much optimism with regard to whether the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, can be concluded this year. Um, there's a large percentage that shows the middle option of um, unable to comment or the RCEP being unlikely to happen. And, and that, for us, was uh, quite an interesting point compared to the roughly 30% who are optimistic that the RCEP would be concluded. And when it comes to how people in this region uh, viewing the possible impact of the U.S. China trade war on the region, about one in five uh, feel that their country's economy will be affected negatively, but there is still some optimism. Uh, the caveat that my colleague Ha and I would like to highlight here is that um, we are just tabulating the numbers. And of course, we can't really go into the whys and wherefores of um, how these responses are being given. Um, but really, it's also too early to forecast the impact of this complex development. Um, I would draw your attention to another percentage. Close to 40% of the respondents have indicated that they are unsure or unclear of the impact of the US-China trade war. And, and that's uh, not a number to be ignored. <coughs> The questions regarding regional security and cooperation, however, show that concerns for the economy, or concerns over an economic downturn, I should say, um, are outranked by concerns regionally for issues such as domestic political instability, ethnic and religious conflict, and climate change. There are country variations, of course, for example, countries such as Laos, uh, the Philippines, and Singapore have uh, ranked climate change as the top security concern. And uh, the detailed report will highlight where other countries in ASEAN have highlighted uh, or ranked the different uh, security concerns based on where their country is located as well as the kind of situational uh, political moment that they find themselves in. And when it comes to ranking uh, the top three concerns about ASEAN, the, the main concern regionally is uh, the disappointment in tangible benefits of regional cooperation not being felt on the ground. Um, this was a top concern for seven out of the ten ASEAN member states. Um, but we like to call the ASEAN enthusiasts, countries such as Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam, um, did not rank this as high as uh, their seven other counterparts. Then we move on to the rolling reach of the major powers such as the United States in Southeast Asia. Uh, this slide summarized some of the findings of the key questions that we have asked on whether uh, U.S. global power and influence has deteriorated compared to one year ago, uh, whether the U.S. can still be relied upon as a strategic partner and provider of regional security, and the answers uh, actually indicate that um, Southeast Asians feel that the U.S. rolling reach in this region has declined and that uh, they don't have that much confidence in uh, the continued reliability of the United States in uh, providing regional security or as a strategic partner. But again, uh, Khan and I would like to highlight that this does not mean 
that the U.S. was not welcome or unwanted in this region. We did not address that question in the survey. So we would caution against drawing that conclusion based on uh, the findings of the questions that we have asked. We also wanted to look at China's role and reach in the region. And so we also asked questions on views and attitudes towards uh, China's re-emergence, as it were, as a major power with respect to Southeast Asia. Now, most respondents think China will become a religious power with an intent to turn Southeast Asia into its sphere of influence, as you will see in the summary slide. There is also a fear uh, among Southeast Asians of being drawn into China's orbit via the Belt and Road Initiative. An overwhelming majority, if you will see in the pie chart, is 70 percent, hold the view that the government should be cautious in negotiating Belt and Road Initiative projects to avoid getting into unsustainable financial debts with China. And so this presents quite an interesting regional finding. And uh, in the survey report, the country percentages will also show um, which of the ASEAN countries have higher levels of concern. Then we had a series of questions that looked at which country or regional organization has the most influence, economically, politically, and strategically, um, in the region, in Southeast Asia, and also a question that's related to whether the US and China are on the collagen calls in this region. And basically, the numbers indicate that China is indeed rising in influence in Southeast Asia. China outstrips the United States in economic influence, political strategic influence, and Respondents also view China as being the country most likely to drive a political leadership in this region in response to the perceived indifference of the United States, as well as uh, that the United States and China are on a collision course in Southeast Asia. Well, influence is one thing, uh, trust is another matter. And uh, our survey invited respondents to share how confident they are that the major powers, China, the EU, India, Japan, and the United States, will do the right thing in contributing to global peace, security, prosperity, and governance. What we have shown here in this summary slide is um, a, 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 a bird's eye view, uh, if, if you will, of uh, the different perceptions of trust and distrust uh, by the Southeast Asians of uh, the different major powers. And you will see that Japan um, ranks highest in terms of trust with the EU and the US in distant second and third places. Um, conversely, the distrust rankings show that China and the US continue to be viewed with more or less equal levels of distrust and uh, the rest of the distrust rankings uh, also speak in terms of uh, which country is distrusted at least. Another aspect of influence is, of course, soft power. And that is an important factor for us because it all adds into the perceptions and attitudes that people have in engaging each of these uh, major powers regionally, bilaterally, internationally. So we asked questions that were related to which country would be the first choice uh, if the survey was wanted or their child were to be offered a scholarship to a university, and uh, which country would be the favorite destination to visit, uh, either now or in the future, <coughs> And which foreign language uh, did the respondents think would be the most useful and beneficial for work and professional development? So the findings we 
history showed that in terms of education and travel, Western sources still dominate, and uh, Japan is the most successful non-Western or Asian self-pollination in Southeast Asia um, when it comes to uh, these two measures. Chinese soft power penetration in mainland Southeast Asia is low, um, which is a bit contrary to the kind of prevalent perceptions that people might have with regard to the countries that are in the periphery uh, of China. But uh, when it came to the language that people felt would be most useful for them in their work and professional development, we see here that China's most potent soft power tool is the Mandarin language, and that was uh, the second highest uh, percentage being after uh, English as the <coughs> university of the most uh, important uh, language for people's work and professional development. Of course, what we have summarized here in these few slides are really the results of the daily survey, and therefore uh, the findings are primarily the results of the thinking, which may not necessarily reflect popular views, but nevertheless, uh, because the people, the, the target respondents of our survey are those who are in a position to somehow be a part of the policy process, uh, we do feel that uh, uh, they have, they give an indication of uh, the general route, so to speak, in the region. We launched the usual overview uh, of the survey findings uh, in early January uh, with the ASEAN focus issue uh, featured here uh, as, as the cover. And uh, the full survey report is uh, also available online uh, separately, uh, as you will see. And we have provided the link for you to further examine and explore the uh, details of uh, responses and percentages. So with this, I would like to express our appreciation to uh, all of you, uh, the audience, for patiently sitting through this recorded presentation, and of course, our most uh, sincere gratitude to the Philippine Institute for Development Studies for giving the ASEAN Study Center this opportunity uh, to share some of the key findings from our regional survey. Thank you, and we look forward to um, further discussion during the open forum uh, after the other presentations have uh, been completed. Okay, so that's the recorded presentation of uh, Ms. Wang Tiha. Our second speaker is also a lead researcher at the ASEAN Study Center of the ICS. Yusuf Ishak Institute. She is currently a fellow at the Regional Social Cultural Studies Program and a coordinator at the Myanmar Studies Program. Prior to joining the ICS, she co-authored several books like the Myanmar Life After Narcis and Do Young People Know ASEAN. She monitors regional integration moves under the ASEAN Social Cultural Community and, his, uh, and her research uh, studies focused on migration issues, climate change, and environmental cooperation in the ASEAN region. She also served as an advisor during Myanmar's ASEAN chairmanship in 2014. Friends, let us hear from Ms. Mo Tuzar. So that's their presentation. Okay, so let's proceed to um, the next topic, which is about the impact of trade conflict on developing Asia. We have two presentations, and allow me to introduce the first speaker. Our uh, first, spe uh, our speaker is um, is uh, is a statistician and a project officer at the Asian Development Bank, where he leads his statistical capacity building initiatives in the system of national accounts, economic globalization value-added taxation, and statistical infrastructure domains. The projects he um, currently leads span more than 20 countries in the Asia and the Pacific region. He was responsible for the development of the asia Focus Multi-Region Input-Output Database, ADBMRIO, 
and the Statistical Business Register System Suite ADD SBR. He started his career at Statistics Canada in um, 1999 and specialized in SMA and Input Output Economics. Ladies and gentlemen, let's all welcome Mr. Mahitan Joseph Marisinghan. Sorry, I'm left-handed, so I like to stand on the other side. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm actually it's one presentation with two people. Uh, in fact, we represent a big team of at least 25 people working in uh, Asian Development Bank on this specific issue. Uh, so far, we have uh, two publications out, uh, one report and a technical paper. And uh, the work is continuing, as you know, because the issue is ongoing. Uh, in fact, it's a two-hour presentation crammed into 20 minutes, so uh, bear with me by rushing through. But uh, I, we will be available for questions after. Okay. Now, uh, the summary of our study relevant to Philippines is essentially uh, Philippines economy could be affected positively as a result of this trade conflict, and we will explain why. Uh, however. Uh, only that segment of the Philippines economy that is highly uh, connected to the global value chains will be positively affected, uh, sorry, positively or negatively affected as a result of the trade conflict. Uh, however, uh, there are other countries in the region that could benefit a lot more than Philippines as a result of the trade conflict, which you will see later. Uh, obviously, I don't have to explain why this conflict uh, has implications for Philippines. Um, many, uh, if you look at the reactions, the reactions and reactions of many countries, uh, you will know uh, trade conflict is starting to affect uh, many countries uh, in, a, in, a, in a more than a significant way. So uh, here is a depiction of how the trade conflict started and how it escalated. Uh, the one. Oh, yeah. It doesn't work on the board, okay. Uh, the one in blue are actions by uh, actions related to the United States. Uh, the one in red are retaliations by uh, people, people's Republic of China. And the one in green are uh, retaliations against the United States by the rest of the world. Uh, as you know, uh, early last year, United States started imposing tariffs on a, a selected number of products uh, like uh, solar panels, washers, steels, and aluminium. And it started to escalate over time. And by September, the United States imposed uh, on Chinese imports worth of close to $200 billion. Uh, it started imp by imposing a 10% tariff. It was supposed to escalate uh, to 25%. But it has been put on hold as a result of uh, ongoing negotiations. However, it would, it could not, uh, so it, it, it may not end, end there. Uh, it is quite possible that uh, United States could uh, escalate uh, the um, its actions against Chinese imports <coughs> by including uh, another uh, another three hundred uh, billion dollars worth of imports from China. And plus another $350 billion worth of inputs over the uh, These are uh, potential scenarios that uh, you could be looking at uh, if and when the uh, trade war, uh, trade conflicts escalates over. And uh, here, uh, the rest of the world could also react uh, against the uh, United States uh, by impo imposing import tariffs on its imports from the United States. Uh, but what you could see is the uh, actions and reactions by China is disproportionately very really small. Uh, that's simply because the United States imports close to $600 billion worth of goods uh, and services from uh, China, but China imports only about $130 billion worth of goods. So at some point, they would run out of uh, goods to impose anything on them. Now, 
why this trade conflict is important for the rest of the world, including Philippines. Uh, this is the web of trade linkages uh, in this world. Now, this is not just a diagram. This is actually data visualized. What we have done is uh, taken uh, more than 6 million cells in the multi-regional input output tables, read it through a program, and it has created this web diagram. This actually depicts all the linkages uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the trade space. Uh, we have to exclude uh, certain countries simply because uh, either it's uh, the trade linkages are like small, or the, the size of the trade is small, uh, or it just, the diagram would get cluttered. And you could see, I don't think Philippines is here. It's simply because on a relative scale, the trade related to Philippines is very small. Okay. Briefly, what our methodology is, uh, we first identified all the goods and services that would be uh, impacted by the trade tariff. Uh, then we uh, calculated the amount of uh, imports or exports that are affected. Uh, we used um, elasticity to come up with exactly how much would be the, uh, how much is the amount of goods or services that would be affected. Then we uh, use the multi-regional input output table uh, to uh, discern the linkages, trade linkages <coughs> across the globe, and then use the uh, input output analysis methodology uh, and to come up with the impact uh, of the trade conflict. Okay, and uh, this is uh, uh, this is uh, described in fairly uh, good detail in our working paper, which we can share with you uh, later. <coughs> impacts. Globally, uh, we looked at uh, three scenarios. One is uh, the current scenario, scenario as you see it, as, a, as you see unfold uh, in, the, in the world. Uh, now, in, under the current scenario, the global GDP would uh, decrease by 0 0.11 percentage. Uh, we were looking at an escalation whereby uh, both China and United States could impose a 25% tariff on each other's imports. And uh, then we looked at another scenario whereby, which was threatened last year, but uh, it's rather unlikely now, uh, another scenario whereby you have the United States imposing a 25% tariff on all auto parts and uh, other countries retaliating against the United States. Once you get to that point, uh, if you include all the scenarios, the global GDP could decline by about 0.5%. However, it is very possible, uh, given that not all countries impose tariff on everybody else, uh, the countries that are not affected by the tariffs uh, could try and absorb the trade uh, imports and exports uh, that would have been uh, affected as a result of uh, the tariffs being imposed on China or the United States and China. So even uh, trade start to be redirected, uh, then the GDP could um, be affected by a lesser amount. So it could go down by about 0 0.25. So this is the global GDP. But if you look at individual countries, United States and China, uh, for example, who are the main players at this point, China could be drastically affected under any scenario. Uh, in fact, China is the most affected country in this situation. Uh, it's the worst case scenario, uh, its GDP could go down by about 1.25%. Uh, uh, and that could amount to a lot of, uh, uh, lot of value added. And that could, uh, that could actually uh, affect a lot of jobs in China. The United States uh, could also be affected, but uh, by a much, much, much smaller amount. Uh, simply because, again, the United States does not import that much compared to China. Uh, uh, from from China. Now, uh, what's the impact for developing Asia? Uh, because United States imposes uh, tariff on certain uh, items that are imported directly from specific um, Asian countries, and also uh, Asian countries supply to China through the global value chain. Um, most countries in the region tend to be affected negatively as a result of the trade conflict. 
uh, it's not much in terms of uh, GDP, uh, in terms of the percentage of GDP. However, uh, specific countries could get affected uh, in terms of employment and so. And when it gets worse, then you start looking at price sector. <coughs> However, uh, if you look at the other countries, there's uh, no blanket uh, tariff imposition by United States on any country except for China. So by trade redirection, many countries, including Philippines, could benefit uh, through the trade redirections. And we try to discern the trade redirections by the trade patterns that we see in the multi-related crowd potatoes. So, the way uh, the results that came out is that uh, you could see Vietnam gaining quite a lot as a result of this trade conflict. And this uh, results has been uh, validated by other studies uh, uh, like IMF and uh, a couple of private situations. And uh, also uh, Malaysia. And of course, uh, I think China. Uh, do you know why these three countries stand out to gain uh, much higher than the rest of the countries? Uh, simply because they have the infrastructure to absorb the um, excess demand. Uh, that would arise as a result of uh, the imposition of tariffs by United States on Chinese products, mainly on electronic goods. They have the infrastructure to produce uh, and supply those goods. Uh, especially, for example, Malaysia can provide high-end goods. Um, uh, Malaysia as well as Thailand. Uh, high, they can uh, produce and supply uh, high-end electronic goods. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and Vietnam uh, could uh, fill the space for the low-end electronic and uh, I think Philippines is here. Oh, well, we'll get into the discussion about Philippines. Oh. Now, uh, compared to uh, agriculture and services, uh, Philippines manufacturing uh, will gain more as a result of the trade cut. Uh, that's because of the uh, huge electronics component sector, sector that Philippines has. Right. Okay, now, you see, uh, as I mentioned, Philippines electronic sector gains uh, quite a bit uh, compared to other sectors in the uh, trade conflict, assuming there is redirection, as we uh, modeled it. However, even though there is a noticeable increase in the uh, exports, the value added which contributes to GDP isn't proportionately high. The reason is, when you look at the Philippines electronics manufacturing sector, what we do here is mostly assembly, uh, the low value adding tasks. If we were to do more value-adding tasks like uh, research and development, uh, this <coughs> number could be quite high. Uh, so that's something that policymakers here should be looking at, whether they should be investing more in research and development and uh, enhancing the technical capacity of the Philippine workers. Okay. No, uh, it's a tabular depiction of what we talked about. Uh, as you can see, uh, mm -hmm. products that are already uh, in uh, when, uh, the, the production processes that are already uh, reasonably well integrated into the global value chain tend to be affected most uh, by the trade conflict, and um, and uh, that uh, mainly falls uh, under the electronics uh, and electric manufacturing and uh, some uh, other manufacturing. However, it looks like, uh, based on the data and the, and the model, the business services, which has been uh, powering the economic growth uh, 
or in the recent years, will get affected negatively. Uh, do you know why that is? Because this sector is highly linked to the global value chain, uh, globalization. Right? This uh, many studies and uh, results and data have shown that the there is either a, a lull in the growth in globalization or actually even a retreat. And uh, also there is more regional value chains other than global value chains. And uh, this, this sector is highly dependent on the growth in your client countries. So in many cases where uh, the trade conflict results in uh, decrease in the GDP of these countries, uh, it is quite likely this sector would be affected negatively. Because uh, your business depends on how well the other country is. OK. Uh, our study was uh, one of the first studies uh, on the topic. And it was followed by, uh, almost immediately, by uh, a study by um, there was one fa one thing that we did not factor into our study is issues like uh, what how it would affect confidence, business confidence and investment, which was taken care of in the IMF study. So what you can see is um, the IMF study, uh, the results of the IMF study are pretty similar when you compare the current scenario and the escalation scenario uh, under various assumptions. However, and, and also for say by country, but when IMF factored in uh, issues like confidence and investment, uh, you could see the global economy getting more adversely affected, uh, which we have not modeled into uh, our study, but we will try and do that in the next uh, year or so. So, what are we looking at? We have not yet seen the end of uh, this conflict. Uh, as you know, United States and uh, uh, China are still negotiating. And it's possible, uh, if things don't go well, uh, United States could increase the tariff on the $200 million to, uh, from 10% to 25%. And there could be additional imposition of tariffs by United States uh, on Chinese goods for, for the tune of another $267 billion. Uh, and it could go on. And, uh, we don't know what the outcome of Brexit is, and as we as I speak now, uh, ADB is releasing another study on Brexit using a similar methodology. And um, again, uh, Philippines um, is not that much affected, but it, it starts to gain a bit, and, and it's only because of the industries like electronics that are linked to the global value chain. And uh, again, uh, as uh, ADB study, IMF study, and a number of other studies have shown uh, countries like Malaysia, Taiwan, and, uh, and Vietnam start to gain the most because of this kind. So that is the end of this presentation. We have additional slides, but uh, in the interest of time, I will not go through them. Uh, and uh, you are more than welcome to contact us to gain more insight into the study. And the offer is if any of you want to partner with us in these kind of studies, please contact us. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation, Mr. Maria Singha. We move on to our next presenter. He is an economist and a statistician at the Asian Development Bank. He works with the team that developed the ADB multi-regional input-output tables. He also does analytical work on the field of global value chains, input-output analysis and trade. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Paul Nilmer Feliciano. Is it? Uh, okay. Um, joint presentation already. Okay. Thank you. So at this point, we will have our open forum. May I request our participants to please state their names and their agencies or affiliations before asking the question. Thank you. Uh, may I invite all the speakers to, to occupy the uh, tables in front for the open forum? 
Yes, uh, Mr. Maria Singham and uh, Mr. Feliciano, please. Okay, so while waiting for for uh, our group to to uh, reach uh, the two speakers from Singapore, would like to remind everyone to please fill up the uh, evaluation forms given to you earlier and submit them to the Secretariat before leaving the, um, the conference hall later. Thank you. So are we good, Sil? We can start? Okay. So um, we would like to ask the first question, yes, sir? <laughs> I'm Jun Tuliao from Dallas South University, and I want to ask uh, the paper uh, written by the ATP statisticians and economists. You use input-output table to the world. My point is, how reliable are the data from the input-output table? Second, uh, is there a basic date for the input-output table? because uh, some countries would have different dates. And third, and more importantly, the input-output table does not show the direction of the trade. It only shows, you know, uh, how much is imported, <coughs> and it's within the economy. So how were you able to answer or detect the impact of tariffs on various countries and various regions. Okay, I will answer it in the reverse order. Um, so, the national input output table, of course, will not give you the direction. Okay. However, if you expand it by bilateral trade, by sector and by country. So if you're familiar with the input output table, there's a column for imports and there's a column for export. Yes. Now what we do is articulate it by country and sector. And uh, we there are various assumptions we make which could reduce the quality of the data. Uh, so that answers your first question, how reliable it is. It is reliable to the extent uh, of the quality of the data that is provided by the World Trade Organization. Uh, we do have data provided at uh, product level, country product level by the World Trade Organization. And uh, we do consumption patterns to expand it to uh, industry, uh, industry levels within the country. Again, it's another assumption but uh, it is an assumption used by almost every organization that produce multi-regional input. And that would give us the direction of imports or exports and the magnitude. Yeah. If I may. Uh, but export and imports are final demand. You know, a major component of this are also intermediate demand, okay? And some of these are imported as well as exported. How did you, uh, you know, uh, differentiate it? final demand for intermediate demand? Okay. Uh, as per national account concept, any export is called final demand. However, we have final data that will give you information on intermediate exports and final exports, as well as intermediate uh, imports, as well as final imports. So, so I did, we do have additional information from uh, international organizations and databases that provide this information. And we have to, if you are familiar with the input output analysis, we need to move away, uh, sort of expand the boundary on input output analysis uh, by uh, refining the existing Leontic models uh, to inter integrate the export and import of intermediate 
So in the paper, we describe the model. And uh, you will see that um, when you expand the import column, for example, or export column, uh, you will see that being disaggregated into intermediate goods as well as final goods. So additional information that we have allows us to provide this kind of analysis at the level of intermediate goods as well as final goods. Uh, we can share with you the data uh, as well as the analysis and give you more detailed information. Are we connected with the speakers for the yeah. Not yet, okay. And I have a question. Uh, Christy Su from uh, Zhonghua Institution of Economics. <coughs> okay. Uh, I heard, according to your uh, uh, research, Taiwan was uh, mentioned a couple of times, uh, but I, we wish we could have benefited from the China-US trade war, according to your uh, research. However, uh, last year, last year uh, we suffered from uh, trade because of a lot of uncertainties and also because um, Taiwan export a lot of intermediate goods to China for uh, assembly and also production work in China and and for any for U.S. market. So, uh, if China's export to U.S. decreases. Uh, our export to China also decreases. So we are highly connected uh, in this uh, uh, value chain system. So that is one aspect. And also a second aspect is uh, we did a lot of interviews with our companies in Taiwan, also companies investing in, 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 in China. Uh, according to their feedback, um, even the 10% the 10 uh, 10 of tariff uh, by the U.S. to China's, China's exports to the U.S. market. Uh, uh, the fact is uh, the importer, the importer and the exporter, or probably the, tra uh, the traders in the middle, absorb that 10% tariff, which means um, the importer, uh, the importer may uh, take, uh, may uh, absorb 5% of tariff, and the exporter absorb 5% of uh, a tariff. And also, you have to uh, put into consideration that last year, uh, last year the uh, renminbi uh, appreciated, uh, de uh, depreciated for about 10%, which actually trade off the tariff by 10% uh, tariff by the U.S. And therefore, uh, last year, if you look at the trade figure last year, actually China's export to U.S. increases instead of decreases. So I think this explains the uh, uh, the value chain, also the globalization of this trade interaction. So uh, uh, I wonder whether you will have a more updated, uh, more updated uh, uh, research on that uh, trade flow, because according to what we understand, the trade flow probably not uh, last year or the year 2017, but the trade flow starting from quarter three last year. Uh, well, actually, uh, will actually reflect uh, the tariffs and also all these trade measures that have uh, that were, that that have uh, impacted uh, trade flows in this region. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, there are a few points here. One is uh, input analysis and the static analysis. Um, it does not. Uh, you can although you can factor it, it does not take into effect uh, the effect of currency fluctuations. Um, the other point is uh, we also did not take into account <coughs> how uh, <coughs> specific agreements uh, between suppliers and demand uh, uh, consumers uh, on how to deal with this situation. The other one is uh, when I say uh, countries like Taiwan, Malaysia, and Vietnam would be uh, benefited. We are taking more of a medium to long term view uh, rather than a short term view. Because in the long term, should this uh, conflict escalate and be seen as being uh, more yeah, of a situation where uh, obviously this uh, tariffs will be imposed at, say, 25% uh, against uh, China, it is very likely factories production processes could be moving out of China into this country. 
So if you see you are because of the value chain and the supply chain, uh, you supply uh, intermediate goods to China. What if that factory now moves to Taiwan? It's my presentation. Yes. <laughs> so uh, businesses make this decision made based on their bottom line. Uh, should uh, this actually, a uh, new factory, uh, by moving to Taiwan, make the same profit or a better profit? Why wouldn't they do it? But as you know, for example, learning, aside from this conflict, uh, textile factories, garment factories, uh, which were in China oh, some time ago, have moved out of China into Vietnam and Cambodia simply because of lower wages. Okay. Now, they find that in, in countries like Ethiopia and Kenya and so on, that wages are even lower, and also they are closer to the European market. Okay. They are moving out of Cambodia, which already had low wages, moving out of Cambodia to even lower wages in, 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 in Kenya and uh, Ethiopia. So this process is ongoing, and this uh, tariff on China could even uh, could escalate that movement out of China. Uh, so we were taking more of a medium to long term view in terms of what could happen should the situation persist. Uh, but yeah, uh, when you look at uh, our initial impact, you could see all countries being negatively affected. And in the initial impact, we did not factor in what is known as the trade redirection. Redirection happens in the medium to long term. And uh, again, uh, currency, uh, what they call currency manipulation, is also another issue related to this trade conflict. And this is also being negotiated uh, between the United States and China. And uh, we don't know what direction it would take. And given how much the currency changes on a daily basis, it is hard to uh, factor that into our currency. Hope that answers your question. No, oh, there's a question from there. Okay. Yes. Yes, um, or, or we would like to inform everyone that we have already connected with our speakers from Singapore. So you may want to ask questions after Thank you. Thank you the question from the gentleman. George Mansano from University of Asia the Pacific. My question is directed to uh, the, the ATP paper. Uh, I was wondering whether you, you had uh, uh, the, the effects, direct, the direct effects of the trade tension on Southeast Asian countries as well as other countries. I was wondering whether you made a decomposition of that real direction of China to other countries and the U.S. to other countries because U.S. also has uh, interest in the Chinese market for which uh, uh, a retaliation by China in terms of higher tariffs would have prevented or make it more difficult for U.S. exporters to access the Chinese market and I was wondering whether they are also looking at other countries or other countries are taking advantage of this opportunity to export to China and not and yeah. to the United States. So and, uh, what what could be the what might be the differences in the magnitudes in terms of uh, of benefits? Okay. So uh, we took into account all possible redirection based on the current economic tool that we have. So that, I mean, we say redirection, it's not only redirection of trade uh, from the United States, uh, so the trade between the United States to China, but also the trade between China and other countries. Because uh, because of the uh, interlinkages that you can discern from the economic table, uh, you will see how as in the case of Taiwan that we discussed. Uh, if, uh, in the current situation, if China is affected, if the demand for a Chinese export goes down, uh, then that has a cascading effect on all the suppliers to China. And that we took certainly took into account. Uh, and also in terms of redirection, then what we uh, wanted to see was what would happen if, given the current economic capacity of all countries, even the current economic capacity and production capacity of all countries, if we 
all these excess demand and supply going to be redirected to what would happen to different countries. And the results that we uh, showed is, is, is comprehensive in terms of the, in terms of the effect on it. Uh, we also took into effect, uh, which was the initial motivation for imposing this tariff measure at the state, is that how much of this uh, excess demand we supplied by local production. So, which means uh, instead of importing, could local uh, uh, production facilities be expanded to uh, supply this demand? And that also we took into account. Another question, please. Yes, sir. Uh, let me ask uh, the presenters from uh, Singapore. Is she listening? Okay. <laughs> 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 My point is again, it's on the data. Okay. Uh, what are the uh, features or characteristics of the respondents? I know I think I answered this, but you know, if it is a survey and, you know, the respondents have certain political or economic bias, they tend to gravitate towards that particular uh, uh, direction. And so that's the reason why I'm asking, who are the respondents to this survey? Can a speaker from Singapore answer that? The question is, who are the respondents in the survey? Was she able to hear it? Can she hear us? Uh, hello. We, we could catch parts of the question, so if you would mind, if you would mind repeating it about um, about the survey uh, respondents, was that the question? Y yes, it's about the uh, the characteristics of uh, the uh, respondents to your survey. And uh, my point is that if these uh, respondents do have similar political or economic bias, you know, their answers, okay, uh, the conclusion will gravitate towards those political and economic bias. Um, right, and that's why I, I, I couldn't get it very clearly, but let me take a stab at uh, trying to address some of the key words I heard from the question. Um, we wanted to engage the perception and active of Southeast Asians uh, who are in some position to either um, inform policy or give their input to the public office. Uh, so if it comes to uh, bias, uh, I, I guess um, the the most obvious, the only bias that we would have is um, we want we were targeting the policy elite. Uh, so I, I'm not sure whether there's uh, there's, there's uh, that you know, the economic bias that that, that we had, and uh, and because we went for full anonymity uh, for the respondents, uh, we also wouldn't be able to follow up to ask them advice and where course.
So, uh, before closing, let me just make a uh, uh, Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, just a statement based on our studies that what we, tend, what we saw was the countries that tend to benefit most from this uh, conflict are the ones who had made investment long time ago on their productive infrastructure. Uh, it, it, it's as if like countries like Taiwan, Malaysia, and, and Vietnam, they, were, they had made this kind of investment in their production infrastructure, started getting integrated into the global value chain in a big way, and this presented an opportunity. Uh, so if this has any policy implications for Philippines, uh, there are a few things that Philippines obviously needs to focus on, and I think in a previous presentation it was brought to light. One is uh, obviously uh, skill, skill upgrading and, uh, and also uh, try and attract uh, more parts of the global value chain because, uh, for example, yes, uh, we are, when you look at the import and export data of Philippines, you see huge, uh, uh, you know, large, in huge numbers in, in the electronic. Uh, however, the value added by Philippines is very small, uh, relatively speaking. So you could expand the value added and increase GDP by domesticating or localizing the processes upstream or downstream to that assembly. But that requires uh, you know, long-term investment and upgrading of things. So this is what seems to be the trend uh, we, we saw in the industry. Okay, so thank you for the questions and to our speakers for sharing their insights. But before we continue with the last two topics, let us pause for a 15-minute break. <laughs>